Hey folks, Randy Newberg here, live from White Pine County, Nevada. Yeah, White Pine County, Nevada. I'm sitting in a mule deer camp with two great people, people I love hunting with. And uh, we just wrapped up what I think is the, I know it's the funnest mule deer hunt I've ever been on. And I don't know if it's, it's going to be in the top 10 fun hunts I've ever been on of any species. But with me are Mike Spitzer, a uh, good friend. Uh, he's been on some episodes before. And Mike currently lives in Elko, Nevada. That's right. Permanent, temporary? Permanently temporary. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like the investment guy who says that he's in the long, in the short term mode for the long term, exactly. or has been. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, and also with me, who's been on many podcasts in the past, is my son Matthew. Um, the three of us drew tags. We drew late rifle uh, deer tags here in Nevada in a in a highly sought after unit. I. I was surprised for the few number of points we had. No, we lucked out. I, weren't you just mooching off my points on this one? Hey, I paid for those points. <laughs> and and you told me, hey, I don't want to go without you having a tag. And then since Mike lives in Nevada, I thought, well, what the heck? Let's dilute your points even yeah. further. Hey, it worked. So, it worked. So, And even with your points, if you want to call them that, Matthew, our odds were like, what we looked it up, what was it? 2.7% or 5.7 for you as non residents Yeah, non residents So, and I was still under 10 as a resident. Yeah, that's crazy. Anyhow, folks, we uh we're going to talk about this uh mule deer hunt and Mike capped it off today. Well, I should should we should we tell him how it ended or should we wait to then? No, we should probably hold off on that. All right. <laughs> All right. So, but before we start, we're going to talk about some real quick business here. Uh, Hunt Talk Radio is what we call Leupold's Hunt Talk Radio. And the reason is, is because Leupold is the title sponsor of everything we do. The TV show, Fresh Tracks, this Hunt Talk Radio podcast. If, if I'm out in the woods, you can bet that I'm doing something that has Leupold product, Leupold thought, Leupold engineering involved in it. And, uh, can't thank them enough for making this podcast possible. Uh, another company is GoHunt.com. They're actually based here in Nevada, and it's through their research service called the Insider that when Mike and I were on the phone this winter, like, hey, let's go hunt together this year. Where are we going to go? And so we're going back and forth looking at all the draw odds and the Insider at Go Hunt. GoHunt.com at forward slash insider. If you sign up, you will have the best draw odds in there. No one has done what they've done, especially for Nevada, because later in the podcast, we're going to talk about how weird the Nevada drawing system is. And you're going to see why the GoHunt.com draw odds, uh, the research, the insight about every unit here, all the public land, all the, uh, you just, you got to go try it and, and, and you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. But GoHunt.com um, right now is running a promotion that if you use the promo code Randy, R-A-N-D-Y, they're going to give you a $50 Sportsman's Warehouse gift card if you sign up for the insider service. GoHunt.com. Don't leave home without it. We've been, oh, I've been on the road. I don't know how long. I, I've quit counting how long I've been on the road this year. And I've been living out of Orion Coolers. Right now, there are four Orion coolers sitting outside this trailer we're sitting in. They're sweet. And that's what I live out of. That's what keeps my food fresh, keeps dead animals from spoiling until we can get them home. And they, they, I, could, I could list off forever all the great things about Orion coolers. Go to OrionCoolers.com and check them out. I can assure you that it is the best cooler you're going to find. It's just that it, it's just the way it is. I don't know how else to say that. So, and then last and certainly not least, and we're going to get into this later because Mike showed up here with the Onyx Maps Hunt app, downloaded 
all the maps for this unit on his phone. So whether we had coverage or not, Mike could go to airplane mode. He had the map saved. What, what do you save them on, Mike? You're, it, it saves it on... Right to the phone. Right to the phone. On a micro SD or to the phone memory? To the phone memory. Okay. And uh, so I'm a little bit old school, even though the folks over at Onyx Maps have been trying to get me up to speed on using this on my smartphone. I have it on my smartphone, but I'm not as techy as Matthew and Mike. So I'm, I guess I'm just old. I'll tell you what. Yeah, you are. It, it doesn't require <laughs> techie because once you figure it out, it's fantastic. Really? Yeah. So anyhow, onxmaps.com. If you use the promo code Randy16, R-A-N-D-Y-1-6, you're going to get 20% off their hunt app products. And we're going to talk about how we use that on this hunt. And and uh, all I can say, as, as one of my old friends would say, he's now deceased, but when something worked really good, he'd say, that's slicker than deer guts on a doorknob. <laughs> <laughs> I've never, I don't know how slick a doorknob gets when you got deer guts on it, but that, that, it would roll off his tongue so quick. Wow. Everybody would look like, what the heck did he, he actually just say? tried it. That's the question. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So we're going to have to spill the beans about what happened here, guys. We, we, I mean, we can't leave the audience hanging there. We had three tags, and we came here, let's see, last Saturday. I mm -hmm. showed up. You showed up on Sunday, Mike. Yep. And so what's that? Six days I've been here. You've been here five. Matthew, he's sloughing off. He couldn't get away from college, from school long enough. So Tuesday I had to run to Salt Lake and pick him up. So you've only been here, what, three days, four days? Uh, this is your fourth day. Tuesday, yeah. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Yeah. Yep. So, but if you want to see what kind of a shot Mike is, go back, go to our YouTube channel and watch the Wyoming elk hunt. I think it's our number two or three viewed episode on YouTube. That was, wow. When did we do that, Mike? 2000? 2013. 13. And as every time Mike and I hunt together, I get all wound up and I'm like, ah, I got to shoot that one. And Mike's like Joe Cool, like, okay, yeah, shoot that one. That's a nice one. And I shoot it. And then Mike's just kind of like steady as she goes. Towards the end, every time he pulls the big rabbit out of the hat. I, I, is that just I, the way you do it? Or what's the I deal? think it's just when we hunt together. Oh, I, really? I get lucky. <laughs> okay. And Matthew told me on this hunt when he was coming out, he said, I don't care how big he is. I just want to get close and make a good shot. Was that kind of your criteria? Yeah, that was pretty much it. Yeah. So you could go, uh, let's see, episodes you've been in, Mike, on the TV show, Wyoming Elk, Kansas Whitetail, you shot that funky looking whitetail in Kansas. Yep. And then you helped me on a New Mexico antelope hunt. That's right. That was you, 2013 as well. Yeah. And then Matthew, he's been on, I don't know how many podcasts. And this is four on podcasts, I maybe, think. Maybe, yeah. Yeah. And then. On TV, you've been on the Montana elk hunt where we flew in on a helicopter and you and I pulled the twofer. We shot two really nice bulls out of one herd, which haven't done that before, haven't done it since. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we'll get it done again anytime soon. Matthew also runs the digital platforms for this operation. So if you're this podcast, Matthew's pretty much in charge of that. The YouTube channel, you're pretty much in charge of that. What else do I need to say about you? Yeah, that's probably it. That it? Oh, yeah. and also, he's about ready to finish up his MBA, and he is looking for a job in the hunting and shooting world. Is that is that a fair plug? Uh, sure, yeah. A any other requirements? Uh, I, I mean, I'd like to be out west, but that's okay. about it. Okay. Well, we, we got all that covered, folks. Now we're going to get into what happened here. How many deer did we see each day, if you had to guess? Oh, man. Average. Average day, 250 deer. That's what I was going to say, two to 300 deer a day. Yeah. And usually when you mill deer hunt, you don't see those kind of densities. That's Never. It is crazy. But from what the biologist said, and you've talked to him more than I have, Mike, 
they congregate in this area. And did they say if they congregate here year round or just as it starts progressing towards winter? Year round. So year oh. round, it just holds the water, it holds the feed. Really? Large portion of the deer herd is just down in this area. That's crazy. I have never seen that density of deer in one place in my life. <laughs> and here's the bad part. I know all of you who understand the Nevada system, you're going to run out to huntnevada.com and you're going to click on draw results and you're going to look up the last name Newberg and you're going to see what unit we hunted. Well, you're walking them through it, so now they'll be able to. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't have made it that easy, but people are going to find out anyhow. So. Oh, yeah. But I've hunted the first mule deer I ever shot was right across the highway over here when I was going to college. Oh, wow. And then I had a tag just south of here, an archery tag. I had a tag up by Elko, an archery tag. Had a tag by Carlin, an archery tag. Had an archery tag up by Jackpot. I've been pretty lucky. I've drawn... You've done well in Nevada for non-resident. <laughs> but anyhow, folks, we came here, and we, we had some... some uh, input mike had done most of the research with the biologists game wardens others did you had you talked to anyone who'd hunted this unit before i did did you yeah okay got connected with a couple of people that had hunted okay and i'd talked to one guy who'd hunted the unit before but we other than that we were showing up just kind of whatever we could do just yeah and, just the slight plan <laughs> the the wing it as it goes plan and we did have the great benefit of our friend scott jones from reno who you've seen scott on some episodes in the past scott is he and i've been friends for 30 years when i was going to college in reno and anytime i come to nevada between old college friends uh, just people I knew when I worked here for five years, they all want to come and help out. So Scott came out a few days early, set up a camp, and he went and drove a lot of the area of the unit. So at least we had some general ideas of what it looked like here because I'd never been to this unit before. Yeah. I, I mean, I'd pass through and I'd, you know, spend a little bit of time here, but it was sure was helpful to have Scott drive around and check things out. Yeah. And, and, Google Earth, Onyx Maps, you know, you, you get a feel for it through mm -hmm. that. A really good feel, but it doesn't say deer right here. No, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I wish it did. But uh, the first, what, let's see, when did we start hunting? Well, let's see, Sunday would have been... The 30th. The 30th, yeah. right, October 30th. And all that were around were itty bitty ones. Lots of does and little bucks. And what the biologists keep telling you? Exactly. Said it gets better each day. Every day. It gets, and so we're kind of telling each other that, trying to <laughs> convince each other that it's going to get better each day. And the first day was, it was almost a wipeout because it was raining, foggy, just really tough conditions. And then you showed up and brought the good weather, Mike. I showed up, but still, remember we had some, it was pretty cold. We yeah. got some a snow dusting for Monday morning. Right. And yeah. uh, it that cold snap, I think, helped out the conditions. Yeah. I think it helped a lot because uh, it, from the first day just to the, the next day when you, uh, the first day you got here, which was the 31st, man, it was a world of different, just in one day, one cold night, all of a sudden it's like, where did all these older bucks come from? And they weren't like old methuselah types but they were that one age class above the little ones we'd been seeing then on tuesday i ran to salt lake and grabbed matthew from the airport and i on the way back i'm like matthew this could be a pretty tough hunt we're not seeing anything real big and he's like oh, i don't care i'm just hunting man i'm not at school <laughs> yep was that was that kind of thought yeah i mean it's it's kind of nice to take a week off from everything yeah even uh, if you got to spend it with your old man and his buddies? Yeah. Could be worse. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, uh, when you're in camp, I got to stay honest. 
Because you know what stories are true and what stories are BS. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm okay with you exaggerating a little bit. I feel like all your stories grow over time, but <laughs> well, that's, that's part to be of getting expected, older. Right? <laughs> I mean, that that's just part of hunting and fishing. You know, I bet you you every fish you caught when you were 12 is now half again as big as it really was. Uh, maybe I yeah, don't know. See, I don't really tell fish stories about when I was 12 though. Oh, well, you will someday. <laughs> so we go and get Matthew, and we get back here. I don't know what time we get back from Salt Lake, like two thirty, three in the afternoon. Yeah, right about there. Yeah, and, and so we, uh, Scott and Mike are waiting for us, and Mike says, hey, I got this plan. We got to go check out this basin. So we start driving back there, and we were, what, Matthew, you were maybe 20 minutes into your hunt and about a 20, I don't know, how wide was that buck? 25? He's 20? past his ears. He's a nice buck. Yeah. And it stands there and looks at us and Matthew <laughs> won't shoot it. No. I mean, I'd been here for 20 minutes. Right. I, I'd sat on a plane for five hours to get here from North Carolina. Uh, I wasn't going to end it in five minutes after we stepped out of the truck. I, I was like, I need to shoot that buck. But you didn't. But I didn't because I'm like, well, then I'll be shooting it out from underneath these guys. So but, they've they've been giving me a hard time about not shooting this buck all week, and neither of them decided that they were going to take it either. So, Well, we we were just trying to be good guys. Just trying to make sure you got the buck you were looking for. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We mooched all your points, remember? Yeah. Yeah. So I... I don't know. I, I, all I know is when we made it up to that trailhead and we walked out on those points and glassed all night, I was kicking myself. I'm like, that's by far the nicest buck we've seen in three days. And we just drove away from him. We did. He stood there, what, at 100 yards and stared yeah. at us for a few minutes, gave did us a, a real good look at him. Yeah, did a lip curl, <laughs> sniffed the ground, poked a doe with his antlers, chased her around the... Uh, juniper tree there a time or two he, that guy was it's like he had a sign on that said I want to be on TV pick he did. me pick me well he's probably going to get his wish though he just won't be dead on TV <laughs> <laughs> that's right <laughs> that's true that kind of footage is going to be on TV so I wasn't sure what to make of it after Matthew passed that buck I'm like he is he's like seriously trophy hunting and i've never known matthew to hunt for antlers before even though you own the family record for the largest mule deer and elk no i beat you on the oh. elk last year oh i see i aced you it out. only took you 10 years <laughs> <laughs> oh, but so we uh i i when we came back that night i was thinking all right we we needed a, a different plan because if Matthew isn't shooting that buck, what's the plan? And unfortunately, you had the plan, Mike. I did. Yeah. <laughs> I I was I wanted to go back up there and look for that buck and shoot him because I thought, well, maybe Matthew'd shoot him the second day of the hunt. But I knew if you wouldn't shoot him, I was gonna shoot him. Even though, what was he? Like, just this really big 4x3, wasn't he? Yep. Yeah, just a big, nice 3x4. Just yeah. It, compared to what we'd been seeing, he was, he he was, was he above was the rest. Deal. So then we come back, and Mike's, fortunately, Mike and Scott, when we were in Salt Lake, had been doing a lot of recon. Did you guys see much for deer? When we were when I was in Salt Lake picking Matthew, up? It's again lots and lots of does, but we were still missing that next age class. Huh? Of what bugs. made what made you think to go to the spot we went the next morning? Just recon, looking at where we're going to have the early morning sun. Mm -hmm. You know what we're going to have to our advantage in the area. Uh, there's so many different options. It was hard just to really nail one down, but yeah. we had to just make the call, and, and I think it turned out well. Yeah. Because we pull up, park the trucks, and walk up on this ridge. And Oh, and we got to give credit to Marcus, our cameraman, Marcus Hockett. Because, first of all, he worked his tail off here. And our cameras only handle 
two audio inputs, and there's four characters in the episode. <laughs> Imagine that, trying to track the audio of four people with two audio inputs. So there's Matthew, Mike, me, and then Scott. So we pull up to the trailhead, and I don't know how many does were in that basin. It was loaded. It was over 100. Mm -hmm. Had to have been over 100 just right at first light. And uh, I'd like to... Th you want to take credit for spotting the buck? No. No? I, okay. I don't think it was... It wasn't you. No, it definitely and it wasn't, wasn't me. me. And it wasn't Mike. I think I was still half asleep at this time. I think so. you were. You had the serious jet lag. And Mike and Scott were on the other side of the ridge... So that only leaves one person who could spot this buck. Marcus, the camera guy. Mm -hmm. He's like, oh, I think there's a, a buck in that group of does. Pull up the spotter. Sure enough, there's a buck in that group of does. Hey, you want to tell the story, Matthew? No, go for it. Well, you... <laughs> <laughs> I'll just interject when I have something to say. Okay. So we go over and get Mike and Scott. And we're all sitting there looking. And this is by far the nicest deer oh, yeah. we, we've seen. Really a perfect, just beautiful, dark horn 4x4. Four four. I don't know what, 22, 23 inches wide. But yeah, tall. right in there with eye guards. Yeah. Just nice, nice frame deer. Yeah. And we're kind of doing paper, rock, scissors about who was going to shoot it. But I think Mike and I were, we, we, we had aspiration. I think maybe we were just still. It's uh, hard with when you, when you know, it's going to get better every day. Right. It's, yeah. it's how long do you keep, you keep pushing keep deferring. it? Yeah. Exactly. And Matthew being a man of decisions, he looked in the spotting scope and said, I'll shoot that buck. And so we didn't even have to do paper, rock, scissors. Other than then we had to figure out how we we're going to kill that buck. Yeah. What do you think of the elevation? Uh, I mean, I grew up in Montana, so I'm not unaccustomed to elevation, but I've also been in North Carolina for a while, and uh, elevation there is nowhere near what it is here. <laughs> so I was uh, struggling a little bit when we were here the first day. Yeah, well, when we charged up the mountain, I was thinking in my head, I'm like, oh, I'm really glad I don't live at, what, 800 feet or 300 yeah, feet altitude? I don't know, something like that. Because... I don't know what we're at up here. 8,100, 8,200, something like that. Over there, yeah, we were just over 8,000. Yeah. And so we head up the hill, and we're trying to get in on this buck, and there's just way too many does. That, that's the sucky part when there's that many does. Sneaking in on them, crazy. We had a good wind, peek over the rise, and now they're up the hill further. And... I apologize, Matthew, if I was getting you wound up, but I'm like, that is a nice buck. Shoot that thing. <laughs> and Matthew's taking his time, getting all set up, and Marcus, the camera guy, is like, I'm on him. I'm on him. Matthew's just taking his time, and he got away. Temporarily. No, I mean, decided not to shoot. It was yeah. too far. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm fine with that. I'm glad you didn't shoot. So we go all the way up the hill. There's this big bench with these aspens off to one side and like three bushes on the whole bench. And we climb up around the aspens. We're above the bench now. And the, out of this service berry, there's, there's mule deer does darting out around us. And I'm like, how could he have got out of here? And you guys were watching from down below. So we were way down below. We were watching. We had seen right where that buck went. And you guys, we were just looking at you and looking at where the buck went. We're like, he's right there. He has to be. I don't think he snuck out. But, yeah. you know, if he hadn't yet, he must have slipped out on us. Yeah. And I wish that we had footage of when he first stood up. But there were three little mulberry bushes down below us, about 100 yards. And we'd been up there for, what, 10, 15 minutes glassing? looking looking and all of a sudden he bolts out from underneath one of those huckleberry trees and he's going he is not 
it's going to stop. I'm oh, yelling, yeah. hey, Buck, I'm whistling, I'm grunting, I'm whatever. He did stop for a second, didn't he, Matthew? But all, all I could see was his antlers when he stopped there. And down the ridge he went towards Mike and Scott. And now we, we, we here's, the, here's where we craft the plan. All right, he's in these service berries down there. There's just little drainage. I don't know, what is it, 200 yards wide? Yeah, 200 by 200 probably. Yeah. And he went and he just dove in the deepest, thickest part of it. And said, "Come get me." Mm -hmm. Kind of. That, that's is like I dare you. <laughs> Pretty what, much what I was thinking he was saying. And Matthew and Marcus and I are up the mountain. We can see Scott and and Mike down below. And so I craft this screwball whitetail plant. I, I, I this uh, on the podcast I've talked about how. I can't get the whitetail thing out of my system. And when I saw that buck in that brush pile, I'm like, this is a deer drive. This is it. This, my dad would be so proud if I could go and do this. I mean, he's up there, if he made it to heaven. I hope he did. <laughs> he's up there looking, saying, go get him, go get him. And uh, so I circle down the mountain on the upwind side of this big patch of brush. And the plan is Matthew and Marcus, the camera guy, are going to go down on the other side. And I'm just going to work my way through this big brush patch that is, I'm guessing it's, what, three to 400 yards from the where it starts on the upper side of the mountain down to the bottom and a yeah. couple hundred yards wide at most. Maybe. Yeah, that's about right. And it gets patchy. Sometimes it's thick and you have to crawl. And yeah. sometimes it's pretty patchy. Yeah. And uh, so as we're leaving, splitting up, Matthew says, you know what's going to happen? You're going to see this buck, and you don't have your rifle. But we never, for TV, we never go someplace with a rifle if we don't have a camera guy. So when we left the truck earlier, I didn't even bring a rifle because if you do split up and you don't have a camera guy, it doesn't do you any good. doesn't do you any good. And I know some people are listening saying, I'd be shooting. <laughs> <laughs> but I... I just can't do that. It's, I mean, we got too much invested in an episode and everything else. And so I start working my way down there, and it's almost as if Matthew called it because I got about halfway through this patch, and I climb out on this little point of rock, and I look, and here's the buck. Right, It's halfway between where you guys are set up and where I'm at, and he's just raking on the tree, just tearing it up. I can hear it, and I'm like, why are why is Matthew not shooting? He's got to be able to see that buck. Well, then I drop down a little bit into the, the brush, and now I can see there's just a little rise between where he's at and where you guys are at. Yeah, so the, the plan that Marcus and I had was we were going to try to find a good vantage point to kind of see around that no matter where the buck would go, we would at least be able to see and then get in a shooting position if we didn't already have one. And so that when we got there, we thought, oh, we're probably going to find something. But when we arrived, it turned out there was not a very ideal spot on any of the locations we were looking at. It was too flat. It was too flat. There were bushes in the way. There were rocks in the way. Um, some weird little contours up at the top. So we picked one that seemed like we would at least be able to see if he went two of the main directions we thought he was likely to go. And turned out that was not the best choice uh, because we couldn't see him. So eventually we looked across the hill and saw him waving at us. Me pointing yep. at it. it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then, <laughs> so we took the hint that something was up and we couldn't see it. <laughs> I was doing monkey flips and handstands trying to get their attention. It was fun to watch from our position. <laughs> Could you guys see me? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. So when we do hand signals, if you put your hands above your head in a big O, that's like a bullseye. That means shoot now. And... So I was doing that. Did you guys see me? I thought Did you were just doing the YMCA. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I yeah. I mean, I haven't been out hunting with you in a while, and so that's a new hand signal for me. <laughs> uh, 
So anyway, we, we kind of got the hint that we needed to move. So we moved up and um, I think he spooked a little bit at that point and yeah. ran. He ran down in the way. brush again. Yeah. And, and then I walked in there and I don't know what happened then. I walk in the brush and I hear a deer run and I'm like, oh crap, he's going the wrong direction. If that was him, I didn't know if it was him. I didn't know it was him or one of the hunter does that were running around there, but I have no idea what happened then. Yeah, I mean, the the last we saw, he was on the side of the hill and uh, had enough time for Marcus to get it set up and me to get set up and then shot and made a, a clean shot on him. He was about 225 yards away. And as soon as he went down, we could hear <laughs> some <laughs> some hollering from the spotting scopes. <laughs> Which was um, Mike and Scott. Mike and Scott, um, a good half mile away, quarter yeah. mile, something like that. So you guys watched the whole thing. Oh, it was fun. <laughs> it was neat. You get a little worried when you see Randy jumping around and... <laughs> <laughs> we don't know what's going on. <laughs> but then we saw that buck right where he came out, right before Matthew shot him and saw him. You know, he started running before the shot, the sound of the shot reached us. So we, uh -huh. were, we were just down. We thought, ah, oh, he, he spooked and got away. And then you hear the shot and then the buck flipped over. It was fantastic. <laughs> uh, I didn't have any idea whether you hit it or not. I heard a shot. And within three seconds, I heard more kayaying and yodeling and hooting and yelling. It's funny. A half mile away, we looked at the footage. We can hear on our audio, our lav mics, we can hear you guys yell. Oh, we were having a blast. <laughs> oh, but the beauty of it was, Matthew, we chased him all the way up the mountain, and he decided to go back down towards the trailhead. Yeah. We didn't have, what, not even a half mile of a pack out. Yeah. I mean, he was probably closer to the trail uh, when I shot him than he was when we first started going oh, after yeah. him, I think. Yeah. So yeah. that worked out well. Yeah. It's very seldom that that happened. Man. It was cooperative. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And when we got up there, man, it was a dandy buck. Oof. Yeah. Man. And I mean, from, from my side, we talked about it a little bit. I was focused more on getting a good shot, getting closer, and not taking a super long shot or one that I wasn't super comfortable with um, for a lot of reasons. First, it's my first day here. I was a little worn out from hiking up the hill. Uh, I hadn't had very much experience with this gun. I was at that first shot when it presented itself, I was at a very awkward angle as far as the gun rest. Yeah. And so I just did not feel comfortable. The second one, I had a lot more time to get settled. It was a lot closer and it just, you know, I was happy. The buck took two or three steps and then just fell over and that was yeah. it. So, yeah, no, that's, that's about as good as it gets. It was great. Uh, it's, I was excited. Oh, yeah. I, so, uh, you know, and w the point of, of going there, Mike, is you and Scott had done some recon and had looked at that spot or across the road. We had, no, spot. we'd gone up in there. Had you? Mm -hmm. Okay. And by that time, so now it's day four, I'm starting to get a little fidgety because we're, we're only going to be here seven days six and a half days and when you're when you draw a good tag and this is kind of for all of the listeners you always there there's people who mean well mm -hmm. who tell you about this rumor and that rumor and it's so easy to go and chase these rumors when you aren't seeing what you want to see and we didn't do that thankfully yeah it would have been easy because it's a huge unit we had a lot of ideas and people yeah. that wanted to be helpful and tell us where to go, yeah. but we could have been chasing our tails all week. Yeah. And I, for me, anyhow, cause I, I do so many of these hunts and I end up in these places I don't really know. I usually look at my first two or three days of hunting to be as much scouting as they are hunting. And then if it's a five or seven day hunt, my next three to four days are all right, what did I learn in my first few days? 
how can I apply that and really just work the plan? Take kind of, it's almost like taking a filter and shaking it and saying, all right, here's what I know. Here's what I learned. Throw out all the junk that I, because you come here with these ideas, okay, this or that. And then you go and look at it, it's like, oh, that was a bad idea. And then you kind of have what's left and you say, all right, this is what I got to work with. Yeah. And you had great advice. So when I kind of went over some of these ideas with you, uh, you told me that you never wanted to go into an area blind and waste your morning hunt yeah. because you don't know what you're going to see in the, the morning and the evening are prime times. Right. So you can scout a little bit as you learn a new area for the evening and, and know what to expect. But going in in the dark, if it's a new area, yeah, you know, you could you could waste the morning. Yeah, I, I never do that. And I know sometimes people are like, well, how did you know that? My And I said this on a podcast. It's like podcast, I don't know what it was, 32 or 34. But I talked about my day-to-day -day approach to a five-day hunt. And... I always have a, a first morning plan. But if I'm going to go check out a new area, it's always in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. Because one, I want to know how to get in there. You know, you take 10 different forks in the road or whatever. You just, and I always have my GPS on, marking my trail when I'm going. I know where the glassing spots are then because I'm going in in the daylight. I, maybe I'll go in at two in the afternoon just so I can see everything. And yeah, I got to sit there for a while. But if it turns out to be a good place, at least all the roadmap is laid out when I go in the next morning in the dark. Yes. Yeah. It's it was great. I mean, it's just it's spot on. Kind of how I got to do it. And, and with what we do here, we don't have, you know, the season might be two weeks long, but I've usually got five days. If there's one or two tags, we allot five days. In this case, we had three tags, so we allotted six and a half but so if you waste a day that's a huge part of your hunt that was just wasted on a fishing expedition and i just i don't know yeah you you've had enough of these tags too mike you you get to show up in plenty of places and try to figure it out it, it, it was great just you know this hunt in particular I, I live fairly close but at the same time I was traveling across the country with my family for the first and I've been living in a different area so I just didn't get time to scout I didn't really have much time other than showing up and having five days to spend with you and hunt yeah and so uh, in that time when you've got five days to do it you just gotta like you say take the best advice you can throw out what you don't want to use or what's not going to work make a plan and stick to it yeah and boy, I tell you what, the temptation to ver deviate from the plan oh, geez. is great. Mm -hmm. And anyone listening, if you draw one of these tags, I mean, you can waste your whole hunt chasing these rumors or chasing these dreams or the buck that was there last year or the whatever it is. And by the time your hunt is almost over, you're looking around saying, you know what? I've not really hunted. I've just run around like crazy chasing rumors. Mm, absolutely. And anyhow, I I try to avoid that. And uh, I, I will admit that I've made that mistake many times, unfortunately. <laughs> and then you really get yourself in this hot box of pressure because now you've run around, you've looked at all these places and you got one or two days left. It's like, oh man, now what do I do? Exactly. Yeah, where'd the hunt go? Yeah. So so that was great. We uh we got Matthew's buck back to camp, hung it in trees, let it cool. What else did we do that day? I think I took a nap. Did you? I mean, I, I'm pretty sure I napped every day of the hunt so far. <laughs> so we're going to go I with tried. yes. <laughs> you got a good nap yesterday, Mike. There's something to be said about naps in, in camp. Absolutely. It's rejuvenating if, if it's the right time for it. Yeah. Sometimes it's the wrong time, but you need them sometimes. I mean, was it this morning or yesterday morning when we took the naps in that little meadow? What, what, that was, that uh, was yesterday. yesterday morning. Yeah. Oh, man. I tell you what. I was snoring so loud. I was like, man, I hope I aren't keeping that I'm not keeping everyone else awake. But 
there there's something to be said for naps in hunting you get up early way before daylight i guess maybe if you got up and you're one of those casual guys who just said ah yeah the sun's up i think i'll ease on out now you don't need a nap because you slept in. You couldn't get the mattress off your back. So, you, 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 <laughs> you know, right. what are you going to do? Just sleep all day or just wake up late? But right. When you're up and you drive and then you hike and you still need to be there before light, then yeah, it's a busy day. Early it gets morning. to be long days. And, I, you know, I do 80 to 100 days like this almost back to back for... I don't know how you do it. It's, well... If I don't have guest hunters, I take a break off, a day off in the middle of a hunt because I just, with my liver condition and stuff, I just get so wore down that I, yeah, I can't I can do imagine it. Just, just leaving here and where you're going to next, you're just yeah busy from one to the next. Yeah. So anyhow, we get all that done, and we're we're now we're, we're like big dogging it, man. Hey, we got a really nice buck here. Or at least I'm feeling that way. Yeah, at we that were point. feeling good. Yeah. I think Scott and I stayed out that day to keep looking because by oh, the time we right. had Matt's buck out, yeah, it was early afternoon. Yeah, and you guys called on the cell phone and said, hey, we're way up on top of the, the pass here. Come meet us. We'll make up a plan. Well... You guys probably wondered what was taking we us did. so long to get we to the top showing. of the pass. Exactly. You guys were taking forever. <laughs> <laughs> because on the way up there, there's this road that goes up a canyon. And every Little Finger Canyon had so many deer. And all of a sudden, there were nice bucks in a lot of those Little Finger Canyons. And we drive around the corner, stopping glass. Oh, my goodness. Look at that buck. Oh, my goodness. Look at that buck. And uh, at this time, by this point, we we're joined by another friend from uh, Reno who'd come over, Matt Hornback from uh, Legacy Sports. So let, let's see. It was Matthew. It was me and you and Marcus and Matt heading up there. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah, because yeah, Scott and Mike were out here. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And so the same that evening when Matthew shot his buck, I, I'd been telling everybody here, I don't care what I shoot. I just like big and ugly and nasty and just something that looks like Godzilla or something. And we, uh, we stopped at this one spot and we were glassing. And all of a sudden this deer steps out of the brush up on the hill. He's a long ways away, like, I don't know, seven, 800 yards. And in the binos, I'm like, holy cow, that's a pretty heavy buck. Get the spotter. I'm like, oh, my goodness. Uh-oh. We only got 45 minutes to get this done. And uh, so we uh, called Scott and Mike. We had a little coverage there and said, hey, guys, I think we're going to be late. Right? We called it. <laughs> and at that, within like five minutes before that happening, I was glassing. Right, and and I saw oh, yeah. A, yeah. a big framed buck right yeah. down in the in the area. I didn't know where you guys were. Yeah, but uh, I was calling to tell you I I saw something. You said, "Hey, I saw something." Yeah, and so we headed down to meet up, and lo and behold, it's in the right same spot. Yeah, and so we're sitting there glassing this buck. And any of you who've been through this before, if you if you feel pressure to shoot big animals, maybe you've had this feeling. I don't. Score means nothing to me. So, you know, you get a good tag like this, and everyone's going to say, oh, you got to shoot a 170-inch buck or blah, blah, blah. And I looked at that buck, and I knew the second I looked at that ugly-looking, mangled-up, trashy thing, I was shooting that thing. He is like this. He was gnarly. Yeah. And man, was he pissed off at the world. <laughs> he, he tore up every tree on that mountainside in the time we watched him. And I don't know what all, if I, did I seem excited, Matthew, or did I? Yeah, you seemed excited. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. And this is where I'm going to hijack the podcast for a few minutes. Okay. Um, but, so, but we're just getting to the good part. Yeah, they can wait. <laughs> <laughs> um, so because you're the digital uh, director of our enterprise, you get to hijack the podcast whenever you damn well please, huh? 
No, it just seemed like a good time. Okay. Well, I hope this is something that's relevant so the audience doesn't turn down, turn it down or turn it off. So well, what, what's we'll, the hijack we'll here? Um, so in my MBA studies, I'm in a class right now where we are assigned the book that's called Everything I Ever Needed to Know About Economics I Learned from Online Dating. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> while I am, have not yet finished the book, I did come across one of the first things he talked about, uh, which I thought was very relevant to this, and that is the topic of settling on something. Settling. Settling. Hold, hold on. Online dating and settling. Yes. Where is this going? Uh, uh, look, keep going. This you, is, this you can kind of guess where this is going. Good. This isn't going to get me divorced, uh, is it? <laughs> no, I don't okay. think so. Okay. Um, <laughs> so settling can be uh, not just online dating or in-person dating. It can be things like how long do you spend looking for a house when you're buying it? Um, how long do you spend looking for a deer before you shoot it? Number of other things. Huh. And you have to take into consideration a variety of different factors from time constraints. Um, yeah, we have some time constraints. The hunts, you know, five yeah. days, that's all we're here. Yeah. Um, the second is kind of the pool of candidates. So... If you're in <laughs> this unit and you're expecting to, say, shoot something that's going to break the world record on day two, well, your expectations might be a little out of line with reality. So, uh, uh, candidates, is that what that, that the term you use? Uh, that's the w term I used, yes. Okay. So online dating, you have to also take into account the, the, the candidates from which to choose. Yes. Just like we had to select the candidates from which to choose. Yeah. Okay. I'm following here. Okay. And how, then, how did you come up with this as part of deer hunting? Oh, well, I mean, it all kind of works. All right. Keep going. <laughs> um, and then the last part is really the effort required or the opportunity cost of what you're doing. Yeah. So if you're... Kind of what you were saying earlier about making sure that you're not going into a brand new place in the morning and getting lost and wasting a morning, um, making sure that you're spending your time doing smart things instead of just doing things for the sake of doing them. Um, and so that's, again, just making sure that you're doing things the right way, making sure that you know where you're going when you're doing it and not just wasting a bunch of time. All right. So I'm following. I mean... It's it's all about making that kind of decision yeah. about, okay, am I going to shoot this one or am I not going to shoot this mm -hmm. one? So in online dating, it's, am I going to date this guy or gal or am I not? Yeah, pretty And much. after I date them, eh, am I going to settle for this or should I keep my standards higher? Right. And so the, if... You had the entire world of people to choose from, from dating. Say you had yeah. 7 billion people to choose from. Odds are that whoever you wind up settling down with is not going to be the very most ideal person on the entire face of the planet that you could wind up with. You settle. Right. But at the same time, there is there are a wide range of people that both of you would be very happy with if you chose to settle with them. You follow on that, Mike? I'm, I'm doing my best. <laughs> All right. So Basically, are you saying your mom, we, we weren't on an online dating service. This was before Al Gore invented the internet, but you saying she settled? I'm, I mean, both of you settled for each other. I know my wife settled for me. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah, I was going to say, I, I see where, I see where yeah, you're going with it. And so, this is, I mean, Matthew is brilliant and things on a whole new level than a lot of us, which is, which is good. Those of you who are looking for a, a uh, master's in business, <laughs> Matthew's a good one to, to pick up. And he's so, available. He's on the market. Every age. The, the job market. That's just, <laughs> right. The job market. Yeah. Not, not the, yeah if your girlfriend, uh, what what'd she think about you uh, researching everything you need to know about <laughs> online dating? It, it is assigned reading for class. She can't say anything about it. Um <laughs> <laughs> so we'll get back to the hunt, but I'm going to drop a quick note here as we've had great fodder to tease Matthew because speaking of settling, he's been dating a fantastic girl yeah. for for numerous, how many years now, Matt? Uh, almost five. 
almost yeah. five. Lillian, we think the world of you. We do. She doesn't listen to the podcast. <laughs> what? We need more downloads. <laughs> what kind of what kind of potential daughter in law that doesn't even download my podcast? Mm-hmm. Uh oh. All right. I don't she, think she even downloads it just to give you the download. Really? She just well, she, I'm going to email her and have her download <laughs> right. this one. So. so we've been trying to convince him that five years is sufficient time to uh, to settle down with. Yeah, to settle. Mm-hmm. Settle. Yeah, she's yeah. the one going to be doing the settling. <laughs> yeah. You're going to, you you if you end up with her, you you will have outkicked your coverage by so far. <laughs> wow. Well, Anyhow, it's been a fun conversation for the yeah for the, drive. Yeah, for the last yeah. four days. Yeah, and so if it, can we go on another tangent here? Sure, why not? All right, since we're talking about online dating and settling, and which we, with the, the, this stock of me wanting to kill this big ugly mule deer really got interrupted here in this podcast. <laughs> right. But I told I, you I was hijacking it. I'm gonna. I, I th- this is an informal poll, and I don't know how people are gonna respond or tell me the answer, but. Matthew and uh, uh, my wife and I eloped about a year and a half before Matthew was born. And he has a standing offer. If he would elope and save me the headache of everything that comes with helping to pay for a wedding, $20,000 cash. Yeah. (laughs) You can have some volunteers, I think. I, I mean, I, I'm interested in if the what the audience thinks. I mean, right. but I might you might just lose any job offers that might just pitch <laughs> for you because anyone with with an MBA who won't elope for twenty thousand dollars cash add that to a five year relationship, which yeah, I, I believe there's another study out there that says people who are okay with delayed gratification do better in life. So we're we're gonna chalk it up to that. <laughs> delayed gratification we this podcast is going right. to hell we're talking about <laughs> online dating delayed gratification right. elope, elope. i mean marital marital advice has been on the podcast well frequently, yeah well so. the marital advice here is you know sooner or later if the fish is on the line and you just think that you're gonna play the fish or whatever and you don't get it in the net Sooner or later, the fish gets off, and you're standing there looking over the side of the boat, singing to the mermaids. Yeah, well, that hasn't been a problem yet. No, well, <laughs> the, the, when you're fishing, it's not a problem either until it falls off the line. Uh huh. I mean, it you was ever a lose problem a big w- fish? I mean, you knocked one off the line in one of our walleye yeah. tournaments. <laughs> yeah, and you were pretty long in the face, weren't you? <laughs> I mean, yeah. But I mean, not, I'm not equating Lily into a fish. I'm just equating the of action of like delaying doing. the gratification of catching the fish. Sometimes you you lose the gratification. Yeah. Well, folks, as you can see, our conversations have, <laughs> have centered around this topic often. During this yeah. Week. <laughs> so we've concluded that we're just going to give up on Matthew ever getting married. There's hope yet. Hey, that's that was the end goal all along. <laughs> what? Get you to give up on it. Just, all right. Just let whatever happens. Okay, so happen. we've hijacked the let's <laughs> let's go back to select uh, what you, settling. Uh, settling. Yeah. yeah. So basically deciding when to pull the trigger on something mm-hmm. comes down to all of these different factors, um, your time constraints, the kind of your expectations of the pool of candidates and then other things you could be doing with your time. Um, taking the example of looking for a house, if you really dislike looking at houses, but like I do, I hate yeah, like you. So you'd probably go look at one or two houses and then pick the one that you like best out of both of those. You're right. That'd Whereas be me. someone else who actually enjoyed it and maybe like gain value internally through enjoyment by looking at these houses might go look at 50 or 100 before making a decision. And so in your two separate things, you're going to settle a lot sooner than the other person, but that's because you're, how you value your time and what you're doing with it is different from right. someone else. Right. No doubt. So when you go back to MBA class next week, are you going to write a paper saying everything I needed to know about economics 
I learn from hunting mule deer in Nevada? I mean, I could. <laughs> I don't know how my professor would take that, but <laughs> so see. maybe uh, I can just show him the podcast and substitute that for the final paper. <laughs> there you go. Right. So we're standing there, and we're looking at this buck up on the mountain through this rotting scope, and I'm not settling at this point. For me, I am like jumping up and down, and Scott and Mike come around the corner and see us parked there, and they see we have the spotting scopes up on the other side of the of the ridge, and they walk up there, and I tell Mike, I'm like, I think I need to kill that buck. And Mike looked at it, and he said, I think you need to kill that buck, or it's something like <laughs> it was that. A nice, it's a nice buck. <laughs> yeah, and he was everything I I wanted. He was big. He was ugly, trashy, ornery. Body size, he looked like an elk walking up there with all those. It's huge, gnarly, just, yeah, just heavy, knobs heavy everywhere. Buck. So the bad part was we only had forty five minutes because in Nevada, hunting season, your hunting hours stop at day at, at sunset. Most days you get a half hour after sunset. So if we're going to get up there, we're going to have to go. And since Mike and I were the two guys who still had tags, we told Marcus, let's go. And everyone else stood down at the trailhead there at the spotting scopes. And Well, it was pretty vertical climb. He <laughs> <It> was, <it laughs> was up about 800 feet off of the, yeah. the canyon floor. Yeah, but we covered time pretty good. I bet you we got up there in, I don't know. 20 minutes? Yeah, we cruised pretty quick. 25, but not without a whole lot of exhaustion oh, and, yeah. and panting and sweating and a little bit of stumbling and falling. But we got around the, this rock pile, and people will see it on the episode. All of a sudden, there, there's this big spine that goes straight up the mountain, and we we have a choice. We go left or we go right. And I start going around the left because that's where all the deer were at. And they go right. And they find this little gap through this big rock spine. And Mike makes uh, like a big loop. I don't know. I, you just kind of disappeared for a minute. I'm I like, went to the other side of that spine to see if he had, I was thinking maybe he had bopped out and I was going to tell you yeah. where he was going. Yeah. And so I look at Marcus. I'm like, where's Mike? And he's like, he's on the other side. I'm like, oh, well, the camera guy can't be on both sides. So if Mike's going to shoot this buck over there, and all of a sudden a doe comes running out, and then the buck comes running back out to, to the side I'm on. And all of a sudden all the deer start running up the hill, up this really steep slope. And Marcus and I don't have any shooting angles or positions. So we got to climb up like another, I don't know, 30 or 40 yards and I get there and the buck is just standing around like what's all the commotion ladies just calm down man I got it under control and I'm trying to get my breath I'm trying it's the worst shooting position in the world I sit down I have a rock kind of against my butt and lower back but I'm shooting up this really steep slope I have my mystery ranch pack between my legs and then I got to lean way down into the scope because it's such a steep angle and it's 180 yards up there and I'm like, this is not good. I'm breathing so hard that fortunately he stood there for as long as he did because the first couple times in my breaths, the, it, it, I wasn't anywhere on his body. I'm like, I, I can't just lob one up there. And all the time, Marcus is like, I'm on him. I'm on him. Which, if you're ever being filmed, when the camera guy is saying, I'm on him, that's that's communication that has to happen because you don't want to shoot something and not have the camera guy on him. But it's almost like this hurry and shoot him feeling. Hurry up. Hurry up. I'm on him. I'm on him. And uh, so the next time, the next breath was like a world of difference and all I remember is seeing the crosshairs low in the chest and pulled the trigger and something hit me in the face. And it was a scope. Drilled me right between the eyes. And I don't know how I didn't get the scope. You know, a lot of people get that cut there. Mm -hmm. 
we watched the footage and the very first thing is I turn back and look at Marcus and say, what happened? <laughs> He's like, I think you shot him. I think you knocked him down. I think he dropped. So anyhow, Mike comes walking around or running around the, the rock ridge. He's like, did you get him? I'm like, I have no idea. I got knocked by the scope. I <laughs> I don't know. I think you both yeah. got knocked senseless. Yeah. And uh, we, we walk up there, and he's laying there, and he's bigger than I thought. His bases are six and a half inches, which you think about that kind of base. On a, oh, yeah. on an antler down on a on a deer, crazy, just heavy, gnarly. Yeah, almost hurts to grab onto him. They're so they got yeah. all these points sticking. Yeah, out he's them. got those big like icicle points everywhere mm -hmm. on him from his base to his eye guards. Oh, yeah. and one eye guard's bladed out. Yeah, he's pretty. Four four points on one side. I thought he was only three on that side. Yeah. And then the other side, he's barely a three. He's almost like a huge forky on that side. But man, he's a tank. Oh, I was so happy. I was just, I beside myself. I, if you would have told me I was gonna fulfill my wish of, of shooting a gnarly, nasty looking thing like that, no way. But to the credit of the rest of the crew, they all came marching up the hill. They did carrying packs and trekking poles and knives and. I Man. mean, if if you could hike up there after sitting on a cactus earlier in the day, I think we could do it without doing Oh, we forgot the right. cactus episode. <laughs> there huh. are photos. They will be online at some there, point. There is incriminating evidence. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm glad you guys came up. It was the easiest pack out I ever had because you guys, every, by the time we divvied everything up among six people, all I had to take was the head. Oh, yeah. One guy had a hind quarter, another guy had a hind quarter, someone had some trim, someone had the front quarters. It worked pretty slick. Yeah, it worked out well. I, I need an entourage like that every place. I, <laughs> when I go to Colorado in a couple days, I would love to have that crew come and pack an elk out for me <laughs> if I shoot easy. one there. Many hands make for light work. Yeah. So in the same day, we went from kind of worrying if, if our plan was going to work to rejoicing that the plan was working. Yeah. It was... We were on a high, for yeah. sure. It was big, big, uh, big stories, backslapping, high fives. It was just so much fun. And that's this hunt, you know, we were talking as the hunt was starting. Is, for me, this was just about the fun of being here with, with, people I, I really have great relationships with and enjoy being with so much. And and if you would have told me that we were going to shoot two bucks like that in one day, I that would have exceeded any expectations I had for the hunt. But Matthew brought up a point I forgot to tell about the cactus issue. <sighs> It hurts to even think about it right now because I can feel these spines in the cheek of my butt now that you mention it again. But we were, uh, what were we doing? How did I set on that guy? We were taking a trophy photo of Matthew's buck earlier that day. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I was the guy running the timer on the camera. And so we framed everybody up and I said, all right, Scott, I'm going to come and plop down right next to you. I'll be on the wide side of the frame. And I hit the button. And I ran over there, and underneath this little mound of sagebrush were three humongous cactuses. <laughs> and with all of my weight, I plopped. Oh, Matthew's showing me a picture right here. That is not fair. <laughs> if that ends up online, Matthew, look at that. Mike, you look like you're doing some sort of surgery in that oh, picture. Oh, he has to get it with me, right? <laughs> Mike is... I'm in pli I got pliers in my I, hand. I am... I'm kind of leaned over, and Mike has the pliers, and he's plucking cactus out of my rear end. I've got my... I got my uh, Sitka pants down around my ankles. I was hoping I could save some dignity. <laughs> Look at Scott. Scott's looking like, holy cow, those are really in there. That's going to hurt. 
<laughs> oh, that's a bad photograph. That I'm whatever political career I have, that's blackmail. Oh, right it's embarrassing there. for both of us. I'm no proctologist. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't really want to get up in there. It'll and be on Hunt Talk in so I, I was, less than a week. I was trying to uh, to save my dignity, so I, I just dropped my drawers and I had my merino long handles on. I'm like, well, at least nobody's got to see my white legs now. But the cactus were in so deep and they broke off that I had to drop my my long johns, and I'm down to nothing but my my BVDs there. And, uh, <laughs> thankfully I have good friends who are, right. who are willing to, uh, I guess, spare their dignity and help remove at least the worst of them. It's going to be February before some of those faster no, you'll be come feeling out. that for a while. Are you looking forward to that, a uh, three hour drive to Salt Lake City? No, on? I'm not. <laughs> Just anytime we've <laughs> sat down here to do anything. I oh, it that. hurts so bad that my right butt cheek has so many of them in them and then my right calf because i don't know i must have kind of done the cross leg squat down thing i buried a bunch of them in the outside of my right calf too i mean i turned around and looked at my britches when i stood up it looked like i'd sat on a porcupine or something <laughs> and these guys had too. you guys found great humor at my expense you were you were quick it's like cat-like speed and reflexes when you jumped out of there hollering. Really? Oh, yeah. Oh, man, that hurt. We it's got more photos. We, oh. we have the in-action photos of the, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. the group yeah. shot here. As the here. timer went off. Yeah. Yeah, as the timer went off, it was right when I stepped on the cactus, and I jumped up out of there. And so the whole crew is looking over their shoulder like, what is Randy screaming about? Uh, I don't know if we... If if we dare post these photos, I'm... Uh, the one is getting posted. No, it better not. Uh, if, if, if you post those, Matthew, you could find yourself in trouble. Here, here's the inaction. <laughs> <laughs> so, I think this one can get posted. That these three, these three posted. are probably safe. That, that would be so, a funny prelude to there, do. The timer was set that all of us were going to pose behind my deer, and uh, my dad was going to start the timer and sit down, and the camera took three photos. The first, uh, everyone except me, is looking at him, figuring out what's going on. The second one, we're all turned around kind of chuckling because uh, we at that point we kind of realized what was going on and in the third photo we're all just laughing <laughs> and i think my dad is doing the rolling on the ground in agony yeah <laughs> oh man but yes See, what you may not remember is this is not the first time that i with pliers have pulled cactus out of you Really? Where was the other one? In New Mexico. Yeah. We were antelope hunting. Yeah. And uh, the camera guy didn't record it, but we were, we had sat down to look at some antelope. And you sat in a cactus. Uh huh. I and remember got that. A bunch in you. Yeah, we were up on that bench. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Ooh, yeah, now I remember that. I bet you if they ever did like an image of me. There's more cactus in my ass. <laughs> it was, it was, it was, it was in your butt too. That, yeah, that I, 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 I hope they don't trigger the meter when you go through the TSA screening or whatever, because <laughs> I ain't getting through for about six months. Uh, anyhow, wonder. that this is we are just full of all kinds of tangents here. Before we get on to the, the remaining part of the hunt, which I think is one of the coolest parts of the hunt, I need to talk about how people can come and hunt in Nevada. Since a lot of them probably aren't residents in Nevada like you are, they yeah. got to go through the non-resident draw like Matthew and I did. They do. And if you want to, go to Nevada Division of Wildlife, and there's all kinds of stuff there you can download the application booklets the whole things you can go to our youtube channel on we have a playlist called elk talk and it's about how to apply for elk tags and hunt western states 
And we did one about Nevada. And what we talk about for drawing an elk tag in Nevada is the same as it is for deer and antelope and bighorn sheep and whatever else you might want to apply for here. Yeah, we've got it all. California bighorns. Yeah. Rocky Mountain bighorn. Right. Mountain goat. Us non-residents, so we can't apply for Rockies. Oh, that's right. Or the mountain goats. Right. Yeah. But the deadline's usually in early April. Yes. Something like that. You get As a non-resident, you got to buy a non-refundable hunting license. And every year you're unsuccessful, you get a bonus point. And they, Nevada, they square the bonus points. Yeah. So if you have five bonus points, they square five, which is 25. And then they add one for the current year application. So you get 26 random numbers assigned to you. They pick your lowest of those 26 random numbers, and that's the random number you have when you go into the drawing. And what is it? Like about 10% of the tags get allocated to non-residents. That sounds about right. Some, something like that. Um, but you and, can put five choices down. Oh, yeah, five choices, right. So that's the that's the cool part about Nevada. Mm-hmm. Your first choice, just swing for the fences, man. Right. I mean, I, I actually, I swing for the fences for the first four choices. You might as well. Yeah. They take your points regardless whether you get your first or your fifth choice. Right. You, lo- you lose all, the, all your accumulated bonus points if you draw a tag. No matter what choice it is, let's reterm that. You you use all of your points. You don't lose them. They, I don't well, know. Whatever. It, okay. I it they feels reset- worse to me to say you just lose them as opposed to you are actually redeeming them for okay, something. Okay. Whatever. You, they get reset to zero. Okay. How's that? Okay. I like that, that better. Okay. Man, yeah, the technicality here. <laughs> so yeah, you you end up back at zero. There's a waiting list or waiting period if you draw antelope or elk. Yep, five years for antelope, ten years for elk. Yeah. And you would know, wouldn't you, Mike? I do know. <laughs> Mike Mike drew a muzzleloader elk tag this year in Nevada. You shot a whopper bull. I I got lucky in the draw. <laughs> I swung for the fences, and I drew a muzzleloader bull tag during the rut in a wilderness area in central Nevada, yeah. and it was fantastic. Yeah, that is a whopper bull you shot. Thank you. Yeah. So, and we saw some lunker bulls here. We did. We saw at least one that's a lunker. Yeah. And we saw his younger brother or something, because look, great potential. looks like a mini-me of yeah. him. <clears throat> but... Uh, but when you want to look at your drawing odds in Nevada, Nevada will post up all of the first choice applicants. Right. But as you mentioned earlier in the podcast, GoHunt.com actually took and compiled yeah. the, the draw all odds five choices. for all five choices. By which, point level. Mm-hmm. They did it. It's called the Monte Carlo scenario where you run a, a, a series, a, uh, in this case, a drawing. You run a data set like... 10,000 times. They, I think they ran it 100,000 times. And it comes up with, okay, here's pretty much how it's going to shake out. So those draw odds at uh, gohunt.com. If people look at most of the other services or look at the published drawing uh, uh, reports that Nevada Division of Wildlife puts out, they're going to think their odds are pretty good. <laughs> and then you look at the Go Hunt odds that are the real odds, you're like, I may never draw. <laughs> A huge disparity between how they how they look for that for that uh, Nevada. But the, but the beauty of Nevada, whether you have zero points or whether you have eighteen points, yeah, you still have a chance. Yep, as long as you get a good number. Yeah, yeah, but just. You know, the guy with 18 points has a way, way better chance. <laughs> it does. But to me, the other beauty of Nevada is it's 80-some percent public land. And even though we're running around with our Onyx Maps chips, I have the chip in my GPS, you have the entire map of this unit downloaded on your phone. Yep. It's, it's helpful to have that. Oh, absolutely. I mean, so you're not worried about private property lines lines because there's a little bit of private property here and there but the way they have to post it in nevada it's it's generally not going to encumber your hunt right um but there's so much public land yeah and it's just fantastic if 
if you watch this episode, you'll see Mike on his smartphone and me on my GPS. And watching you on the smartphone app, I really got to get myself more comfortable with that, more dialed in, and quit using the old GPS as the crutch. Because <laughs> your aerial views, you can't get that on a GPS. You can't, yeah. <clears throat> I mean, you were zooming out your screen, or I guess zooming in. Yeah, just like with a picture, you can zoom in and out. Yeah. It's, it's great. I had it, so I... I hadn't used it before this year, and I had a GPS that you use, and it's it works fine. But the maneuverability of a phone is fantastic. And before my elk hunt in Nevada, um, I'd connected with with Matt Seidel over there on on X Maps, and I got the app on my phone. Um, and you're able to download however much you want. So I could download the whole unit I was hunting for about a gigabyte of data, put it on my phone, and then I could be it was saved. So I was offline. I could be in airplane mode. I knew I was going to be in a wilderness area without any cell phone service. And I could still use my phone, use my the map that saved, and it would still show me as a blue dot working just like a GPS does. Yeah. Because GPS does not require uh, data service. or coverage or anything. It uses the same GPS satellites as a handheld right. unit. Yeah. So it's overlaying all of that onto this aerial image it's slick, it uh, is slick. and you I can mean, add layers and you can add guzzlers and you can add property boundaries you can do anything you want to do with yeah. it so i i'm glad i watched you so nimbly maneuver with it because it it's now it's one more step for me to leave the take my, my tight grip away from that traditional old GPS with the Onyx map chip. Yeah. And the chip is great. It served me well, but I can see there's so much that it it can't do that the mm -hmm. app can do. And you're going to have your phone with you for a camera if it's a phone to do everything, so yeah. Why double up on what you're carrying? Yeah. Who wants to tell the rest of the story? You got any know. more tangents, Matthew? I mean, I can come up with plenty of tangents. <laughs> <laughs> we we could easily take this podcast to three hours if you let me just go off. We're on not doing tangents. <laughs> we're we're wore out because the last story we have to tell is that on day five, I was starting to get worried yesterday. <laughs> I feel I'm like, a little pressure myself. I'm like, did they all leave? <laughs> we, we, it was it was getting better every day. Yeah, I've been. And then we had a warm day. It just kind of warmed up. Yeah. And Thursday was was a little disheartening. Yeah, we didn't. Did we see? Well, last night we saw that one buck that yeah. we all we we went over that other trail spot, that parking spot, and glassed him, but. But he wasn't much. Once we got a good look at him, he right, was, he was only twenty inches wide. He's a, you yeah. know, deep forks and everything, but not, not what you were going to shoot. Yep. So I was, I was fretting actually. I'm like, <laughs> don't tell me we shot the only two shooter bucks here that have come down to the, to the, ground or the land of milk and honey here, where all the, all the does are hanging out, but. So it was pretty uneventful that day. It was a day where it, you know, where you question the plan. You I do think. that. That's a good point. I I think it's easy when you have one of those days to question the plan. The temptation to go searching. Exactly. Is like is throw high. a hail mary and let's drive thirty forty miles and go look somewhere new. Yeah. That was a temptation, but yeah. And but if you do that and you go there and that's a bust. Then you then you feel even more scattered. Mm -hmm. You're like, well, maybe I should have just stuck with my plan. At least I would have learned a little more and a little more. I would have maybe seen another pattern. Or so, I'm I'm glad we didn't do that. But there were times of weakness where I probably could have been talked <laughs> into it, even though my experience tells me don't go on one of those fishing expeditions, Randy. So. And then this morning we got up and 
And, uh, and so I shouldn't even be telling this part of the story because now that Matthew and I had filled our tags, we were just Sherpas and spotters. <laughs> That's this, right. This was Mike's hunt. And and uh, we kept having this discussion, and Mike's like, look, I don't like being a dictator. I'm like, Mike, be a dictator. Democracy doesn't do well when time is crunching, and, and we got to go get something. We got to go scrounge one out of the woods here. That's right. Everyone said, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? I said, yeah. hey, well, what, what do you think you should do? Yeah. No, Mike, you tell me what you want me to do. Mike's way too nice of a guy. He should have just said, shut up and do this. But <laughs> he, we, uh, we ended up with a pretty good plan, though. Yeah. We saw a lot of bucks this morning. We did see a lot. We split up. We we combed some country that always looked good. It was kind of in a transition zone where we thought the big bucks that we hadn't maybe seen the day before were could be kind of coming in and popping out of their deep cover and checking yeah. out some of any of the hundreds of does we were seeing. Yeah. Um, turned up some extra bucks, but still didn't find a shooter. No. Uh-uh. Yeah, we did have our morning spot disrupted by some guys who were road hunting for coyotes. <laughs> <laughs> I'd never seen that before, did you? They, they drive out where we're glassing, park their little Toyota Tacoma, and start blowing their predator calls. In the middle in the of truck. a stage flat. Yeah. <laughs> in the truck. <laughs> in the truck. Oh, man. Within, what, 100, well, 200 yards of us, probably? Yeah. They saw us. They, they saw we our there. truck parked, and they pointed at us up on the ridge above us. <laughs> oh, well. That's just part of public land hunting, I guess. Now Not it worked out about. because it pushed us to a different area. Yeah. I'm. Yeah, now that you say that, it's a good thing they did. Yeah. Because we would have, who knows what we would have done. Yeah. And uh, so we spent a couple hours checking out some stuff. I hadn't been in there, but you and Scott had been into that spot. That's right. And I, I, it's I a little rough. It's kind of out of the way, but mm -hmm. that's also what made it good. Yeah. It's a little rough, a little out of the way. And if you have a brand new Nissan Titan like I do, <laughs> it really does a number on your paint job. You, you mean a brand new Nissan Titan like you used to have. Right, yeah. A now highly used <laughs> Nissan Titan. Um, you, you have friends like Mike who say, oh, you can make that. That's right. E you could just hear this cat claw scratching deep gouges in your paint job. But... Nevada racing stripes. Yeah. I mean, after the first few, it's like it doesn't matter anymore. Yeah. Go I just fast. had to help you get over that. Get hump. it done. <laughs> right. So uh, I, I liked where you missed the giant rock and sent the cameras and everything flying in the back seat. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I was trying to dodge one rock, and in Nevada, everything's a rock pile, and I hit a really big rock. And anyone who wasn't wearing a seat belt flew up, hit their head on the the pad on the inside of the roof, and the cameras flew and. And so my new truck, don't buy a used truck from Randy Newberg. Let's just, let's just put it <laughs> that sure. way. But so we got out of there. That, that burned, what, two hours going up in it there? It did. It was now, we got out of there at 11. Something like it was, that. It was yeah. warm today, too. Yeah. And, and then we decided we, uh, we'd go up to that one spot where we'd glassed that buck the night before that we turned. He wasn't a great buck, but. It's yeah. been one of our more productive guys. It's where you were. Were you at that trailhead the night I shot my buck and you were looking south and you said. Yes, we were at that crossroads right, right there. there? Mm -hmm. Okay. So you can see a lot of country. So you can yeah. see with your spot and scope and spend yeah. all the time and you And you can see it in many different directions. Oh, yeah. Which is the beauty, no matter where the sun's coming from. So this, <laughs> this is something that I, I keep trying to do with the YouTube channel. Um, back this up a minute. Yeah. Uh you made the comment it was warm. What does that mean in respect to the hunt or the strategy that we we're talking about or animal movement or anything in regards to that? Just trying to make sure that we're not losing people along the way here who aren't as deeply uh, into this as we are. Oh, you mean that w the warm day Mike talked about? Yeah. Like, yeah. What, what impact does that have on the hunt? I, I wish I knew for sure other than the end result was we didn't see a lot of a lot of that good age class of bucks that day. It got up to, what, 70? Yeah, it was warm. And so, it's, yeah. yeah, 70. Warm is in the 60s, 70. It's 
hot during the day. It's still getting cold at night, but it seemed like early when we're in a transition hunt or a rut hunt where the rut's going to begin, the colder the weather, the better to get them moving, maybe to push them down out of some of the higher country. And whether it does or does in a warm day, you know, you don't, especially when you're not seeing anything, it makes you feel like nothing's yeah. going on. And, and I think what happens is they're in their winter coats now. And yep. 70 degrees to be running around doing what they do in the rut, they'd rather lay down during the day and say, I think I'll do this running around at night when it's 30 degrees instead of 70 degrees. Well, and 70 degrees at 8,000 feet with a bright sun right. is brutal. Is brutal. And so that kind of, that answer, yeah. what are you thinking? Because today was a pretty warm day also. It was. And when we got out of that spot and then we went up to the other glassing area and we saw that buck, we walked, because we saw him in the spotter and we said, Oh man, the mirage is so bad. We got to get closer. Yeah. We got to get closer. That buck looked like he was just trying to find a place to get out of the heat. He was. You're right. Because it was hot in the high sun today. Sitting still up under the brush. Yeah. So that took about an hour. Something like that. Yeah. At yeah. least yeah. by the time we got all the way up top climbed a ways yeah. came back to the truck and mike looked at him and said no he's just a really big three by three i don't want him <laughs> he didn't say i don't want him he said ah uh, i still got this evening and tomorrow morning in other words he wasn't ready to settle for it yet there you go back to this <laughs> exactly. online dating program matthew's talking about mike wasn't a settler today <laughs> isn't there isn't there like a direct tv commercial where they say we're yeah, settlers the settlers commercial there's a board game called the settlers of Catan, which is oh, really? pretty popular huh well mike wasn't going to be a settler it wasn't. I was trying to hold out to the bitter end. <laughs> <laughs> it was funny. We were talking about that. You're like, yeah, well, mm, no, this is what I want. I don't have any problem going home empty-handed. Yeah. I, I found, and many people I'm sure have, but I've killed, a, a, you know, some some decent bucks. Mm -hmm. But then, especially on a hunt like this, where um, I, I kind of had a a goal right with it with a tag like this and and it would have been easy because there were some nice bucks that were tempting and mm -hmm. to to end the hunt on a day or two early but i had we had the time i didn't have anything pressing at home you know i was here with some good friends and just thought you know what let's let's ride it out yeah it's only going to get better every day so if i <laughs> wait too long and end up empty-handed I, I was okay with that yeah well getting back to the heat factor we had not driven we we left the one crossroads that parking area there and i don't we hadn't went very far at all because there's that little water hole right down below mm -hmm. where we'd been parked and you know, to get a full gist of this you would have had to spent the last six days driving from trailhead to trailhead point to point and as you're driving to all these places you see deer everywhere and so we're trying to go to this other spot and we just left this where we went on this big long hike and turned down a deer and mike says stop i i thought i saw a deer back there right by that water hole and i'm thinking to myself how many times have we stopped on this hunt and looked at a deer and it's a doe or a forky or whatever yep. and uh I think Big Hank was thirsty because it was hot. <laughs> yeah. It was almost noon. Yeah. Midday. Yeah. And yep. And so we said, stop. But we had to get out. Let's back up here. Let's walk over and see. And just I saw a big body and I thought just enough in my mind, you know, because we were tired. We were going to yeah. head somewhere back and we had some work to do for yeah. the show. Yeah. We had a bunch of YouTube segments we wanted yep. to shoot. I thought, ah. Uh, just enough in my mind to say I got to look at him again. Yeah, and uh, I'm I'm glad you did. <laughs> it <was. laughs> so it didn't take but one look through the binoculars when I when I got a good look at him. I said I'll shoot that buck. Yeah, and I'm walking around the backside of the truck we'd parked, and before I can even get around to Mike's side of the truck, he's like, "I'll shoot that buck," 
And I'm like, what, what is he talking about? I mean, he went from almost asleep to amped up, just full excitement in about a second. Yeah. I'm like, well, I can't even see the deer at this point. I'm like, where, where, what's, where is it? And then finally he stepped out from behind that little, I think they're like a little bit of, maybe I was looking in the wrong spot. I don't know. But it's like all of a sudden he just popped up out of mm-hmm. somewhere. I'm like, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, shoot that buck. <laughs> and uh, so we went and got packs and spotters and went and found a good shooting position for you. And Yeah, been all in pretty fast order too. <laughs> in really fast order. By the time you get cameras set up and you, you know, you march out there to get to where you want to shoot, and he wasn't really hanging around. He wasn't. So he, he was like, "Uh oh, yeah. I came to get a drink, and I'm caught." <laughs> <laughs> he did. So we caught him. You know, wide eyed, bushy tailed. He was. Yeah. He was full in the rut, which helped out. Right. You know, but. Because yeah. the first time you said you saw him, you said that, that you had a range of like 320 or something? Yeah. I think the first time when we kind of got set and I got the range finder out, 320. Yeah. And then he was going straight away. Yeah. And he kind of turned across that hill. And I ranged at 380. I'm like, oh, oh this is getting out there. And he wouldn't you, stop. Uh uh-uh, uh. You laid right in the prone position. And well. A very long shot, but a very good shot, and that buck got to ride out on our back. He did. And we can't tell people just everything about it, because we need them to watch the episodes. Yeah, but. yeah there's plenty to watch, but it gets me excited just talking about it. Again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm not sure what was better. Well, the shot was excellent, so we'll say that was better, but... Our hooting and yelling and back slapping afterwards. I've watched the footage now. I'm like, man, we were excited. <laughs> <laughs> you can't reenact that no. stuff. That's just, that is how, well, it's why you hunt. Absolutely. You know, absolutely. For the highs, the lows. The mm-hmm. I mean, it, we'd hunted hard this morning. We, we were there. Would we wait a half hour for the sun to even get to the point where we could even see? We were weird. I mean, we wanted to be there. It was, mm-hmm. And then... Yeah, you've been glassing that hard for five or six days, and it does wear you down a little bit, and you start thinking, well, maybe it's just not going to happen. Especially maybe. when you're not seeing what you're looking for, but yeah. we stuck to the plan. Yeah, and I I think you made a good comment, Mike, after, after you shot that deer is, you know, this just goes to prove that you don't go back to camp. Yeah. You, you don't just call it quits and just hunt the wee morning and the late afternoon Uh, when you don't if if you and i've often talked about how hunting is you know and i use elk hunting but it could be any hunting a huge percentage percentage of it is hard work and experience a little bit of it is you know knowledge and and everything else and then five percent of it is luck and I don't want to say this was luck, but if you're in camp when your luck or your chance comes and you're not up on the hill, guess what? Your ship sailed and you weren't on the ship. Right. <laughs> That's just how it is. And just being there, working at it. Exactly. Uh, that buck is a testimony to don't don't let your guard down. Don't, don't go back to camp just because you're wore out, just because you're tired. And uh, but we had antelope steaks waiting for us. Yeah, we did. It was <laughs> it was funny. Uh, the The plan was that uh, Scott was going to come back here to camp at noon and start cooking dinner, and we're going to swing by and grab a bite to eat on our way to another spot to do some YouTube clips and some other things before the evening hunt and. Uh, Mike got up to a piece of cell phone coverage and called Scott and said, hey, don't know if you got lunch ready yet, but get your butt up here because we got a dead deer on the mountain. That's right. (laughs) (laughs) And Scott, being the great guy that he is, finishes cooking the antelope steaks and brings them up the mountain to us. Great. (laughs) 
Oh, they never tasted so good. Oh, man. What a fun hunt. It was a great week. Thank you. Yeah, well, thank you, Mike. Thank you, Matthew. I I know for both of you with your schedules, it's hard for you to find time to, to do this stuff. But it's it was a remarkable week, I like I said at the beginning of the podcast, I think. I, this could be one of the... It's probably the funnest mule deer hunt I've ever been on. It'd be hard to top. I mean, it's yeah. definitely been my my yeah. funnest. And, and yeah, and just and it's been fun. The people we've had in camp, the folks who've stopped by, you know, some stop by for a day or two. They know we're in the area, and they mm-hmm. help out a little bit here. Or there, we had Curtis, Matt, Scott. It's it's been fun. Good just, friends, good people. Yeah sharing camp with everybody and just doing doing the fun stuff and but i wish i could impart some fantastic mule deer hunting wisdom but i'm not a good enough mule deer hunter to really do that other than when you see the buck you want to shoot just go shoot him yep don't don't worry about what other people are going to think cuz some people will look at that buck i shot and they'll say oh well he's only a 160 inch buck They'll measure the buck by a score. Yeah. But that buck has, if, if Boone and Crockett had a record book for ugly and for character and for oh, nasty, it. trashy, he'd be top 10. He's, he's a great buck. Yeah. But Matthew, I see you writing notes there. Are you going to take us down the road on another tangent here? Because we we don't have that much time left. I mean... I mean, I'll dive into it, but it's not really a tangent. Okay. It kind what, of is. What do not, you got really. there? I, I, you, uh, the guy takes, he's got like a three ring binder here of, of pages of notes he's been taking while we're doing this. Yeah. Um, so yeah, shameless plug time. Okay. For? <laughs> for us and us. Us. Us is the uh, TV show. Some people are related to the TV show, the YouTube channel, uh-huh. things like that. Uh, so first, in case you are, all of you as in the audience are not aware, you can go to YouTube and look up Randy Newberg Hunter, the yep. channel, yep. and find full episodes of everything that we've aired over the last few years. The in last addition, eight years. There's eight years of episodes out there. Yep. All completely free on YouTube. Yep. Um, there's another 120 other videos yep. out there of, Tips and tricks, various yeah. other things. Yeah, equipment uh, reviews, you name it. Um, and then one of the things we're starting now is we're actually calling for topics for future videos. Right. So basically we want to hear from you what you want us to talk about in our kind of reviews and tips and tricks and hunting informational videos. Yeah, a little clarification on that, Matthew. We asked in that video, and you can see it on our Instagram page, our Facebook page, and it's out there on YouTube. We asked for, what do you want for YouTube topics? And I glanced through them the other day. It's like what people want for TV episodes. Which, I mean, it's, it's good helpful, to know, but, but it's, it's a lot easier for us and yeah. a lot more doable for us to do you know, right. how do you sight in a rifle scope as opposed to you should go hunt some black tail deer? <laughs> right. Yeah. So, so. For those of you who are providing comments, thanks. And we'll definitely listen to the ones about uh, TV episodes you want to see also. But TV is a much different animal. We can't be as flexible on TV as we can in YouTube. So that's why we're asking for that. We, we want to know what people want to see. Yeah. Um, and then some of our other platforms, uh, we're on Facebook, so you can yeah. follow. Or, yeah, we're over 30,000 Yeah, now. <laughs> just past 30,000 on Facebook, which is great. So follow us on there and get some updates. Right. And there's always some doing. sort of drawing going on on our Facebook yep. page. I mean, right now, Caribou Game Bags. In fact, Michelle, my social media PR person, drew the winners on Wednesday. So here we are, we're two days late. But anyhow, it's an, an example of sponsors are always sending us gear to give away on our Facebook page. So you yeah. never know what you might win out there. I like those Orion Cooler drawings. <laughs> yeah, we do an Orion Cooler every month. That's great. I know. Yeah. People have been pretty fired up about those Orion Coolers they're winning. 
I mean, they, they're built well. They, they do their job. They are, they're the bomb, I guess. Isn't that what you guys say your age? Yeah, they're sure. The bomb. <laughs> I don't know what the hell that means, but <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll go it's with no that. Ryan Cooler. That's what it yeah. is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we got any, what else you got there? For yeah. So a couple more things. Uh, we also have Instagram. Yeah. Uh, Randy Newberg Hunter is the official one. I'm also going to shamelessly plug my own, uh, which is Matthew Newberg. Um, what? you, you occasionally get some behind the scenes things of what's going on here, which yeah, is how Matthew I'm doing will this. Post more of the behind the scenes stuff. Um, possibly the cactus butt photo, but if you <laughs> post that Matthew, I will beat you like a rented mule. Uh, okay. Maybe not that one, but some of the other ones. And then our camera guy, Marcus, Marcus, yeah. uh, M Hockett, M H O C K E T T on Instagram. Um, also post some behind yeah, he the scenes posts a things. lot of cool stuff while um, we're out in the field he is also a an actual photographer and so he's got some very Amazing high quality images, images yeah. on there this, the sponsors are going to be really happy with the images marcus has been working on this year yeah he goes he works so hard i'm i'm gonna have to pay him more money <laughs> I'm going to have to pay you less. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm not getting paid anything right now, so I'm not sure how you do that. <laughs> you got to pay the power bill. Yeah. Um, and so that's it for Instagram. Finally, as you know, since you are listening to the podcast, is we have a podcast, but one thing that would help us out a lot would be is if you would actually go to iTunes Store or the Google Play Store, wherever you download this. iHeartRadio. Yep. Leave whatever. a review Stitcher, about the podcast. iTunes. Yeah, um, leave a review. And that should, shouldn't take you too long, but it really helps us to get feedback. It yep. helps us in our rankings and makes us more visible on the platforms. And it makes our sponsors very happy. And when our sponsors are happy, we're able to produce, produce more, more of this content. content, and hopefully that makes you happy. And so hopefully it's good for everyone all around. Yeah. So that's all I've got. That's all your shameless plugs. Yeah. I now. thought you were going to put a plug in there for Dairy Queen or M&M. <laughs> Mike tried uh, to kill me this week. They're not sponsors yet, so I can't do that. <laughs> what, did, what did you say this week with those M&Ms you were buying? He bought a two and a half pound bag of peanut butter. Peanut butter M&Ms. Oh, my goodness. It I'd is. never had them before. They're, they're great. I'm going to have them a lot more, I'll tell you that. So I got... I started with a little bag, and Randy dug through that pretty quick. Oh, that wasn't day. even an appetizer there. <laughs> you you can't buy a four-ounce bag of M&M. No. I mean, so, tomorrow's your birthday. Tomorrow's my birthday. I'll so, I bought a you know, pretty cheap, but two-and-a-half-pound bag of peanut butter M&Ms for... So, I got him diabetes for his birthday, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah, well, Matthew, you can buy me the insulin for my birthday. Yeah. Now. How's that? What if I just buy you Dairy Queen? That's, well, that works. <laughs> there isn't a Dairy Queen I know of in this town, uh, in this part of the state. We'll, we'll so. be in Salt Lake City tomorrow. There's got to be one there. Yeah, we'll be in Salt Lake on our way to Colorado, living in tents for another seven or eight days. Oh, man. It's a good thing I have great camping gear. You do have great camping gear. Because if I hadn't. If I had yeah. mediocre gear, as many days as I spend in a tent, life would get miserable in a yeah. hurry. It's tough. I mean, what you do is exhausting, but at the same time, it's hard to uh, garner sympathy for it because it's a pretty fantastic <laughs> lifestyle. <laughs> some pretty amazing adventures. Dang, Mike, you aren't helping me out there. I was looking for some tears of of sympathy or concern or whatever, but I don't think I'm going to get any around here. But... No, I, uh, the, f the funny part is, uh, you know, I use a lot of Hilleberg tents and, uh, I got to pick up two new ones because I'm trying some new ones out for them. And it, if there's one fun part about what I get to do, it's the product testing. Yeah. I imagine. Yeah. If you're, if you hunt, you're kind of, I think all hunters are a little bit of equipment junkies. Mm-hmm. And so it's nice when these companies value your opinion and say, hey, you probably spend more time doing this than anyone. Because I, I look at my my Nalo uh, 2GT Hilleberg tent that I have, and I was counting, I think I'm at over 350 nights in that tent. 
Wow. Since I've had it. I bought it in 2008, I think. And so they're like, can we send you some other ones? We want some input here. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, send them to me. I'll, I'll tell you what I think. And, yeah. but whether it's that, you know, last, earlier last month we had Tim Lesser from Leupold. He brought a bunch of new products that Leupold's working on. And it, th that is one of the fun parts of what I do. I mean, yeah. it's all, it's a lot of work, but it's fun. Uh, and if if ever you, you you get to that point where people trust you or at least trust that your experiences are going to be valuable to the valuable feedback to them that's when you say all right i'm i'm glad to do this yep so we got any closing comments guys what do we get when are we going to do this again when are we come and mule deer hunting in nevada I don't know. Hopefully soon. <laughs> yeah. I don't have what fifteen points anymore to no. turn on it. So no. But you got sixteen elk points in Nevada. Yeah. You might be down here elk hunting. You can't party app. Can't do a party application in oh. Nevada for anything other than deer. You can't combine resident and non resident applications for anything other than deer. So I don't know. Might be a while then. It might be. Yep. What else? What, we got to conspire. Oh, we're we're applying in Alaska, aren't That's we? That's right. Yeah, Mike and I've been month. we've been cooking up this plan in Alaska. We can't tell you what it is because we don't want to ruin our draw odds. Everyone else will go and apply, right? But I can just promise you that if we draw, it'll be fun. Yeah. Yes, it will. I, I guarantee it'll be fun. But any last comments, Matthew? No marital advice. No, I, I don't think I've made it far enough in the book yet to <laughs> the book about economics and online dating to yeah. really give marital advice yet. Yeah, what the hell? I I can't believe that <laughs> you're paying tuition and the textbook is everything I need to know about economics I learned from online dating. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting. The book basically tries to summarize economics into uh, examples and stories that people who have no background in economics can, can relate to and kind yeah, of... Yeah, but you've taken a lot of economics. I have, but it just makes it more amusing to me okay. uh, kind of the relationship instead of just going from the technical kind of academic side. Um, yeah, right. I, I don't really have much. Okay. I guess get sleep. Well, we were make hoping sure to that you were going to make like some big <laughs> engagement announcement. Right? Or like, but, finally. Yeah. I wouldn't do no. that on the podcast. <laughs> no. <laughs> if, if it was going to happen, it wouldn't be on the podcast. I can oh. guarantee that. Okay. Huh. I don't know if that's a comment about our podcast, what little regard you have for it, or just how <laughs> private your life is. Uh, the second one. Okay. Huh. We'll get Lillian on the podcast. Also, can you imagine how mad mom would be if that was <laughs> where the announcement was, was on the podcast? Ooh, we'd both be, we'd get beat like, oh my goodness. A red-haired stepchild would dig, wouldn't have the, the lumps that the we The dog have. would become the sole inheritor of everything. Yeah, I'd be in divorce court. You'd be disinherited. Yeah, tell her first. If you're going to, if you decide you're getting married, <laughs> tell her, I... Ooh, I want to I wanna make it to my 28th wedding anniversary. So with that, Mike, what do you got for a parting comment? Anything All right. you want to leave the audience with? Any words of wisdom? Any Words of wisdom. No, I'm just, I'm at my 15th, almost 16th wedding anniversary. All so, right. Yeah. All right. We both have done well. Yeah. Married up. Yeah. But uh, it's just been a, it's been a fun week. It's been fun to hang out again and go hunting. It's been you know, it lives get busy. It's been too long. So, and I've I've said this throughout the season here on the podcast and on the TV shows that I've reached the point in my life where who I hunt with is really important, more so than what we're hunting or where we're hunting. And uh, I just feel blessed to have so many cool people that I get to hang out with while we're hunting and. You know, this week with you guys and Scott and Curtis and Matt and everyone was 
That's that's why I hunt anymore. It's been great. I, you know, I, I I don't know when it happened, but somewhere in the last five years, my mindset about hunting has just changed from feeling pressure that oh gosh, I really need to this tag. I got to shoot something big or. You know, gosh, I, I really don't want to come home empty-handed to, you know what, anymore, I don't give a hoot. <laughs> it's just sitting up there on that mountain behind the glass telling old stories and yeah. and swapping lies and talking to Matthew about what his future is or you and I planning our next hunt together and just enjoying what it represents. That. I'm glad to be at that point in my hunting life. It's, I want to say it's a relief. It's, it's a reward, I feel. <laughs> and uh, I'm sure everybody gets there at some point in time. Maybe some get there sooner, some get there later, but I'm kind of there now. And, and it's actually very relaxing when you're producing TV that I don't feel any pressure. You know, I've to, noticed that since it's been kansas was what right. first or second season second yeah. season i believe right and then wyoming a few years later mm -hmm. and now here it's been yeah i can see the stress relief i guess during the, right. the filming of the episode yeah i mean when you start out and you're green in this business like i was you kind of fall into the you know you jump right into the race you get on the same treadmill as everybody else and then you kind of look around and say, you know what? I don't need to be on this treadmill. Yep. I'm here to tell stories. I'm here to, here to tell stories about people, about places, about conservation, about whatever. And yeah, don't don't uh, ever doubt that we're not hunting hard. Oh yeah, we're we're giving it our best effort, and we have the complications of public lands and you know all that competition and whatever. But now. I just want to tell a good story. And sometimes the story involves three really amazing Nevada mule deer That's in right. one hunt. It's a good Plus story. A cactus. And a cactus in my ass. <laughs> and we're we're never I I don't foresee we'll ever have a hunt again where we shoot three mule deer of this quality in one week. It'd be pretty hard to do. Yeah. If we do Tell me where we're going right. to do it because I want to start <laughs> applying there. But anyhow, folks, thanks for listening. Mike, thanks for, for taking the time after a long, hard day of packing a deer off a mountain to put the headset on and tell stories. It's been for, great. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Matthew, thanks for somehow finagling your, your professors into believing that you're out here actually doing work. I'm not sure how you did that, but... I sure enjoy the times that we get to hunt together and hopefully we uh once you're done with this school in May we can get back to hunting more often. So yeah. I hope. Me too. You got lots of points. <laughs> you need to burn them. <laughs> Even if I'm just along spectating. I, I, I need to share them. No, you don't need to share them. Just burn them. I'll go along. I'll be the Sherpa, the camp cook, whatever. So anyhow, folks. Tune in again in a couple of weeks. Hopefully we'll have another big story to tell you about an elk in Colorado that uh, wanted to be a TV star. Thanks for listening. <laughs>